Hello, everyone. Um, pretty excited to have our speaker for the CS seminar today. Uh, this is second in the series of awesome assistant professors who are doing cutting edge research uh, and presumably looking for students, so you should work with them. Um, Jing Zhang is our speaker today. She's a new assistant professor here at UCI. Um, and she's been doing a lot of cool stuff in the areas of bioinformatics and computational biology, some of which we're gonna hear about today. Um, and specifically, she's been looking at computational methods for understanding how genetic variations um, can result in phenotype changes. So um, I think this is a really exciting application area for computer science, uh, including machine learning. Um, and so we'll hear about some important problems. Um, so welcome, Jing. Take it away. Hi, Samir. Thank you for your introduction. Hello, everyone. It's exciting to have a chance to talk to everyone. And uh, this has been a tough start. Uh, and I hope we can like, uh, uh, have, a, have a chance to see each other in the future to communicate more. And uh, so today, let me first share the full screen. So can you see the full screen now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. So to, yeah, today I'm gonna talk about uh, recent uh, advances in my research that is to leverage multi-omics data for disease genome mining. And uh, so a little bit more uh, background about me, actually, I came from Southern California. I, get my, I got my PhD in University of Southern California. And that is when I started to make, make, make a transition from electrical engineering actually to computational biology. And I did my postdoc at Yale as associate research scientist. And I worked in ENCODE for six years in their data analysis center to annotate the genome and uh, try to explain uh, the genetic uh, reasons for, for human disorders. <clears throat> so uh, we'll talk about these uh, different topics there. And uh, so my major research goal is to link the genome variations to different genetic disorders. As you can see, there has been quite a lot of progress when the sequencing technology is available and the scientists has discussed, uh, discovered different risk loads for a variety of disease. And uh, <clears throat> so if we look at the human genome and we'll see we have a very, very huge genome, it's 3.2 billion base pairs. And we zoom into it and uh, the Human Genome Project actually set up a, a reference genome for the 3.2 billion base pairs. And if we zoom into different people, we'll see there are differences. So, so for some of the, the locations in the genome, there are which, which we call variations or genetic variants that everyone, they have a different uh, like nucleotide but for some of the locations in the genome. And on average, each of us carries around the three million base pairs that is different from the human genome. And because of these different combinations of mutations in the genome, uh, in the human genome, we are unique and what we are one of a kind among like the whole population. But sometimes some mutations causes not just phenotypical variations, they actually cause a lot of like uh, abnormal phenotypes and uh, even genetic disorders. So my goal is to link which mutations in the genome can cause the pheno phenotypic differences and even diseases. If we look closer into the human genome, this is actually our current view. Only a tiny percent, around 2% of the genome that we can see if it happens, what is the, like, uh, the consequence because they make instructions about uh, how to make in proteins in our body. We can see directly a consequence in, <clears throat> in the mutations there. However, for the over 98% of the whole genome, they do not directly make directions about the protein coding process. They were previously sought the junk DNAs around 20 uh, years ago. And then over the past two decades, there's a lot of efforts that are going into this dark matter in the genome, trying to see why 
they do not directly make proteins, but they host the majority of the disease lost reside. And then later, uh, by some like uh, computational effort and experimental efforts by the personal invest investigators and some premier like a consortium work like ENCODE, the roadmap epigenomics uh, and phantom. Actually, we know for those dark regions in the human genome, they contain extensive gene regulation information. Although they do not directly make proteins, uh, they actually play an important role to indirectly impact how the proteins were made. And uh, they actually play an important role in deciding the final phenotype of different individuals. And, uh, so how do we study these dark regions in the genome? Actually, as you can see, this is a chromosome. We look deep into it. We think there are different properties that may impact the protein coding regions. And then we have different sequencing technologies to measure each of these features. And then my role is to analyze those different types of sequencing data, set up computational models and pipelines to come up with biological conclusions. And then we integrate the entire like uh, different uh, <coughs> features together and to annotate the genome, see, okay, which region may play some particular role to regulate some gene. And then in those regions, if there's a mutation, what might be the phenotypic consequences of these mutations. So this is a rough background of what I am doing. So, but if we look at this problem more carefully, we start from three billion pair, pair, base pair nucleotides in the human genome. And then we know three million of them actually are different from the, the, the reference genome. And then we are trying to find either one very rare mutation or a combination of different common mutations that may be disease causing. This is actually pretty challenging. It's like uh, finding this panda among all this looking very similar like snowmen. So <clears throat> for this challenging problem, we start to think about uh, at different layers, what are the consequence impacts of, of the genetic variations in the context of human diseases. So as you can see on the DNA level, we have different nucleotides. And then uh, the important part of the genome is what proteins different uh, like uh, we, we have in, in, in the cell. And then there are elements, what we call the regulatory elements, their on and off status determines the expression level high or low to these genes. And then there are some regulators, they actually connect and detect, like decide the on and off status. And those regulators, which is highlighted on the very top, actually they co collaborate or they compete with each other to, to control the on and off status of this, uh, this uh, <coughs> regulatory elements. So, <clears throat> With this multiple view of the gene regulation in the human genome, we try to answer two questions. The first one is how to construct this regulation grammar in different cell types. And the second one is with this regulation grammar, how do we link the dysregulations to the disease status? So here is uh, like uh, a lot of tools that we have developed to try to construct the genome annotation on the very left, and then do the disease genome mining on the very right to investigate the genetic impacts in, in, <clears throat> in different diseases. So today I'm gonna talk about the three recent work. The first one is DART, a convolutional neural network for enhancer predictions. So if we look at the, the, the human genome, and we know the axon regions actually are the discontinuous regions of the genome that make, make proteins. But there is another very, very important part that is called enhancers. They are actually located very, very far away from the protein coding regions. And then in the 3D structure of the genome, they actually looped back to interact 
from the promoter regions, which you can imagine is uh, around the beginning of the transcription start sites. And they can activate this gene expression and they host quite a lot of uh, like disease related loci in the human genome. So to find where is the enhancers into the dark genome is one of the most fundamental questions in biology that help, to, uh, help us to understand how this gene's transcription process is activated. So about 10 years ago, when we do not have quite a lot of features, we rely on unsupervised learning methods. For example, the very famous method on this is CROM-HM. So we, you can imagine we chop the whole genome into different bins, and then we have different features that has been measured by different biochemists and biochemical experiments. And then for each bin, we use a binary feature like zero or one to show whether a certain biochemical like modifications exist in this, in this entire bin. And then we use some segmentation technologies like uh, uh, the hidden markers models to segment the whole genome into different classes and define the function according to our annotation to a particular class. And then recently we started to collaborate with many uh, experimental labs. And now we have a new technology that is called whole genome star seek. So it can parallelly like read out the enhancer activities by some reporter assays. Actually, with our collaborators, we have trying, we have collected across many cell lines different star seek experiments. And then we also have the matched biochemical features in those, in those regions. So we are trying to think now, I think it's a time for us to do a supervised learning for this enhancer prediction problems. So remember previously when we were using unsupervised learning due to technology limitations, we use binary features. And right now, because this sequencing data is uh, like uh, being shared across, like, uh, across the world. Actually, we can see the non-digital signal patterns at a finer resolution of the genome to see what it looks like. So we centered the signals for each star seek peak, and then we immediately see these signals uh, centered on those candidate enhancer regions is never random. As you can see, the x-axis is the relative base pair according to the relative to the center of each enhancer region. And then there is a very obvious pattern, like uh, the quantine, it is open, and then transcription factors binds in open quantine regions here. And then you can see there is a dip in the histone modification measurements through the chipset data. And uh, there is, uh, so this biological like a process actually inspired us whether we can come up with some better enhancer prediction algorithms. So we actually use convolution neural nets. We, you can imagine for each nucleic, each region in the human genome, we have a multi-feature like vector and we use, we can treat it like a image, like a one, two, three, five, a different uh, for example, channels, RGB channels of the image, and we try to predict whether there's an enhancer or not. And because we have the whole genome star seek data, actually we can have quite a lot of such training data for us to better capture what is the combinatory, like a signal tracks like this, the combinatory patterns of different features to define an enhancer. And then we want to do a better job than that because previously when we are predicting enhancers, it's fixed the lens, but actually the lens of enhancers or the core regions of enhancers changes from location to location. So <clears throat> what we are trying is we look back into our neural nets about the, 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 in the weights through grad cam, and we try to refine our prediction. We do, we, we do not only say, in one huge block, for example, one thousand base pair or two thousand base pairs in the genome, whether there's an enhancer or not. We're also trying to define what are the core regions 
that helps to define this the enhancer. So you can imagine for the regions uh, like, like, uh, like these peak regions, they are more important. And then we should scrutinize these regions better rather than other regions. So for example, they are less important in defining these enhancers. So we provide a finer scale nucleotide level uh, explanation of the functional of the, the function of the non-coding regions uh, rather than is an enhancer or not. So we have different file, uh, five cell types and uh, we, we did our training and validation by merging these five cell types. And then we see the performance is okay. It outperforms most of the state of the art non-supervised learning methods. And then we wanna say whether merging these cell types is actually a good strategy because may maybe each cell type has its unique signature. So what we are using is actually we leave one cell, cell type up for validation and use the four remaining like uh, cell types to train our model. As you can see in the independent validation data set, uh, our performance is pretty good. And then we compare it uh, with uh, one of uh, the, the, the most recent uh, unsupervised uh, enhancer prediction method that is called Match the Future that was published in uh, this July in Nature Method in part of the ENCODE package. And we'll see in all cell types with real experimental uh, validations, we outperform this Match the Future ma matrix. And then you may have a look at what it looks like in the human genome. Actually, rather than this, for example, here, rather than this very, very clean signals, the human genomes like a signal for this bell markers actually looks very much like a like a noise. There is it's never like look like a perfect uh, like a mark as we see if we aggregate them, but you can like uh, have a feeling of how the positives actually are different from the negatives. From for example, for the positives, you can see the DHS signal is in the center and there is a double peak in uh, right in the middle of of the DHS signal and it's well aligned and are coordinated among different features in the human genome. So we apply our DART model in, in, in a group of psychiatric disease related cell type. So you can see in the original data we have, if we do not use GradCam and we use a very like a long region to just say whether there's an enhancer or not, we have almost five times of the size of important regions defined in the human genome. And then of course, in the TSS region, which is close to the gene region, this refinement is not as obvious as the distal regulatory genome. We use only 20% of the data, but this 20% of data is super conserved across the, the, the different uh, species and uh, they contains less rare like uh, mutations. So basically these regions are important regions that they do not allow like uh, random mutations. Otherwise uh, there will be some phenotypic disadvantage in the, in the population. And uh, we compared, we use these regions to explain the GIVA variants, which is the variant that we are, we are, we are using to uh, explain the psychiatric disorder phenotypes, uh, actually we see using only around the 20% of the or original data, actually we can explain better of the psychiatric disorder related uh, phenotypes. So this is our first work and uh, please don't, don't hesitate to, to, to ask me some questions if you have some like uh, uh, questions during, during my presentation. Okay, let's go to the second part. So the second part of this presentation is uh, more about the disease genome mining. We already built up various annotations on the human genome. We set up the co-regulation network uh, and we wanna see what the changes in the disease genome as compared in the normal genome. As you can see, the co-regulation network is a network on the very top, how these like uh, regulators one, two, three, five, they work collaboratively together with, with, with each other. 
So we focus on, on a very important uh, regulatory uh, network that is TF, transcription factor co-regulation network. You can see different transcription factors. So they need to work together to bind either in the enhancer regions that we defined earlier or in the promoter or near the gene regions. So these enhancer regions uh, mediated by these transcription factors, they will fold to the promoter regions. Together, they will initiate the gene transcription process, which is the key to making correct proteins. So our hypothesis is if like the disease in the disease status, if some transcription factors, they changes, they jumped out of its, its common social circles and it does not bind with its old friends, we think we need to follow up with this transcription factor. And then, so you can see our, our, our whole process is we construct this TF-TF co-regulation network in disease and the normal status separately. And then we calculate the differences of these networks by counting the rewiring events, which is the gain or loss edges in the in the differential network. And then we try to find the, the transcription factors that actually changes a lot of its social frames in the network. And we want to follow up with, with those with the experimental experts. So, but what we have actually is something like this. We have different chip six signals and they are very noisy over the, the entire genome. They may be high or low and uh, for different transcription factors. And uh, so what we did is we, we chopped the whole genome into different bins and uh, each bin, we count uh, the signal track uh, for each experiment, for each uh, chip seek experiment of per transcription factor. As you can see, we get a matrix with the rows indicating the activities of one transcription factor over all the bins in the human genome. And the columns indicate for a particular bin, what is the activity level for all transcription factors. As you can imagine, if we have a high XIG, it just means for this particular transcription at this bin, we think it's more likely to be active if XIG is very high. So in one condition, we are, when we are trying to see whether two transcription factors that is corresponding to two rows here, they collaborate or not together, that like they appear more than expected together in the human genome. Actually, we use, uh, what we can use is uh, the graph model, the, the, uh, the Gaussian graph model, right? And uh, we use the precision matrix uh, to measure the conditional independence of the transcription factors. We use this pre precision matrix to just rule out, for example, in this, uh, in this case, and the one and the two, they always come together. And two and three, they will always come together. But the one and three, there's no true interaction. So they just seemingly to be all together because they all work with two. So we use this uh, Gaussian graph model to, to infer the condition independence among different transcription factors. And then in the disease condition, actually we have two types of the networks, normal and tumor. For example, if we are investing cancer like uh, uh, cases. And then we want to estimate the difference of this co-regulation network under like two conditions. For example, these transcription factors, so they work together in one condition, but they do not work together in, in, in another condition. So instead of directly estimating one of the, each of the network in two conditions, we try to, because we are only with limited data, right? So we are trying to directly estimate the difference of this, uh, this, uh, this net, of this network changes under normal and tumor conditions. And we use the, the uh, lasso d trace loss method to estimate uh, the connection changes under tumor and normal. And we introduce the different uh, penalty parameters. If we give it a larger penalty, we'll end up with uh, 
a sparser network, if we give it a smaller penalty, we'll end up with more changes that can be estimated from the two conditions. And then we use some stability uh, related measures to, to do the model selection to decide what is the most appropriate uh, penalty parameter here. For example, if XX is observations, we actually can subsample the beans and uh, we set different uh, like parameters for lambda. And uh, for each sampling process, actually, we have a lot of network estimations by randomly sampled different regions of the genome. And we calculate the st stability for each of the different lambda parameters over many, many randomization process. And we set, set a threshold. For example, we think all these orange regions, they are stable enough, we'll select the smallest penalty to, to be like uh, used in the original estimation. So the intuition behind this is we try to encourage our network to be as dense as possible. So we follow up as all possible based uh, combinations. And uh, as long as the network estimation is stable enough, so we, we include this, this uh, model selection uh, process in, in our diner model and applied it on leukemia samples. And here is the top genes that we see that is actually changes like its friends quite, quite often. We were very, very surprised when we say BRCA1 because this is a leukemia samples, but BRCA1 is actually one of the uh, marker genes for breast cancer, you probably can guess from, from his name here, right? So we were thinking, okay, what's the link here between leukemia and the possibly like, like this gene? So we search up to TCGA, which holds the gargantuous amount of expression data from the tumor and normal patients. And then we use the BRCA1 activities in different samples. And we can immediately separate the different samples into two groups. One group is the high and one group is low. We can say that in the high activity group, usually the prognosis for the patients actually are worse than the other group. In this way, we demonstrate using completely independent data that our method can highlight or prioritize some key regulators through network level analysis. And we further try to see why this BRCA1 actually is one is related with leukemia. So if we look into detail of the normal worst tumor chip stick data, we see BRCA1 and the PO2, they are canonical pairs that co-bind in the promoter regions. They need to bind there to initiate the transcription process and stabilize the human genome. But somehow, in, in, in BRCA1, in the tumor cases, it, it just uh, left home and it goes deep into the non-coding regions. It does not work anymore with PO2. So there, this process, this breakup actually can, it can in, introduce some instability of the human genome. And that is actually disadvantage to cancer patients. And then let's go to the third part of the, of the talk, that is the RAG LDA, that is to use latent uh, Dirichlet allocation to measure the network rewiring. And at this time, we are actually looking at the network between the regulators to ditch different regulator elements. We'll see what's the, the, the gain or changes in the, in, the, in the disease transition process. Again, we use a tumor as a, one of the application cases for our method. So on the very top is the regulator. So you can see they are transcription factors. So they are indexed by one, two, three. And on the very bottom, A, B, C, D, they are actually the target genes. And uh, we are trying to compare such network from the tumor cases to the normal cases. We always say, okay, in transcription factor one, there may be no change under these two conditions. We'll say, okay, this may not be playing an important role in cancer progression. 
But uh, in the second case, for example, two, they gained a lot of edges in tumor as compared to normal, or three, they actually have lost two edges in this network transition. We'll say, okay, we probably want to follow up with these two transcurrent factors to see what's going on and what is their role in cancer. So this is a simplified case. And uh, we'll see in the real case, we have a lot of transcurrent factors and we have around the 50K target genes. We infer such network using ChIP-seq data, which is very, very sparse and it's very noisy. For example, for one transcription factor, we expect less than 10% 10, 10 of the genes. They actually regulate its, 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 its expression profiles. What made it worse is if we directly using the counting algorithm, for example, we just count like one or two changes, our underlying assumptions is the target genes actually are independent of each other and they contribute equally to our prioritization process in this analysis. And, uh, but this is not true because the genes actually, they are not like uh, living alone in, in, in our body. They work, they communicate with each other. They write different pathways. So if, for example, our transcription factor one, they jumped within one cluster, for example, with the metabolic pathways, or they actually lose the connections or gain the connections that are spanning more than one cluster. Actually, they have different indications. And again, which make it more complicated is these clusters, they change dynamically according to application scenarios. For example, in cancer research, maybe some of the style cycle, like pathways plays important roles. But uh, for psychiatric disease, maybe some of the neurons, the synapse functions actually plays bigger roles. So we cannot use a unified information to actually use in all application scenarios. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to capture those information automatically inside the network itself. For example, you can see how in the we add some hidden layers. For example, we add 15 meta cluster genes and they represent 50 different biological pathways, right? You can say A is a metabolic pathway. They have different ways, connections to different genes on the very bottom. And it's okay if they have overlaps, but we try to capture such information automatically from the, the network itself in different applications. So what we, we use is uh, the LDA model here. So you can see we treat uh, like uh, the, the target gene pools for one transcription factor as a document. And, and then we have, uh, in this case, 109 documents because we have this many transcription factors, right? And then we, we are trying to automatically capture the topics to mimic the biological process of like, uh, for example, the pathway information that are important in this specific disease setting. And then instead of marrying the changes directly from the top layer regulators to the target layer like genes, we are actually marrying the changes between the transcurrent factors to these meta genes to automatically capture the dependency between different genes on the very bottom. So here is what we did. We use LDA and we have many documents from the tumor samples and from the normal samples. We pull them together, we train the LDA model, and then we project this, this uh, transcurrent TF to gene matrix to TF to topic matrix. And then we measure the changes in this low dimensional space. Or you can say for one transcription factor on the right, if its distribution across these topics changes quite a lot, we'll say probably this is the important transcurrent factor that we would like to follow up. But on the other case, in this green case, if we see its distribution across different topics actually is very similar to each other, we'll say maybe 
there's not that much change between tumor and the normal cases for this transporting factor. And uh, we probably will not follow up with this, this TF in our, in our ex experiment. So <clears throat> what we did is, uh, this is one of my, my favorite figures in all my publications. I call it the Christmas figure. So we divide the transcription factors in, according to its network changes in leukemia to two groups. On the very right group, we say it's a gainer group that those transcription factors, they actually gained quite a lot of activities. On the, on the left side are the group of transcription factors that lost quite a lot of activities. And we try to annotate them. As you can see, many of the oncogenes actually appeared as the gainer group because they actually gained a lot of activities in, in tumor samples. And many of the tumor suppressor genes, like uh, PML, they, they, they actually uh, fall into, into the, like, uh, the other end of the spectrum. And then we can see some of the transcription factor, for example, MEEK, we consistently see it from multiple tumor samples that it gained a lot of activity. Actually, we picked up MIC here for experimental validations. We knocked down MIC in the tumor cell and try to measure different, uh, for example, uh, cell growth measures or target gene expressions. And we did see actually MIC is a marker TF that is a signature of many, many, like uh, more severe type of cancers in both breast cancer and lung cancer. Usually, if we see in patients, this MIC activity is higher. And in those cases, we will see the progress of the patients is in general like worse than other like a group. So today, I introduced the three major parts of, of my, my, my research, that is uh, annotate the genome and uh, analyze the co-regulation networks and uh, analyze the changes of the TF regulatory network. And I'm gonna talk about a, like some part of my ongoing work. And uh, <clears throat> so my central hypothesis is that uh, how to define gene regulation and how to define the dysregulation in the genes in disease samples. So we can prioritize some risk factors for different genetic disease. It can be a uh, transcription factor, it can be a particular region in the genome, or it can be a single nucleotide in the genome that may introduce some, some disease. So on the very top, that is how I'm gonna try to incorporate a large population scale functional genomic data to annotate the genome. So Currently, <clears throat> in ENCODE, actually, in the past six years, I have been working on the back tissue data to annotate the genome. And now I'm trying to migrate to the single cell data at the top technology advances. So we are trying to integrate a different single cell data, for example, single cell ATAC, single cell RNA-seq data. There is a lot of computational challenges, for example, for the clustering, for the batch effect, uh, like. Uh, correction problems for different uh, like uh, network construction problems and variant interpretation problems at a single cell resolution. And uh, there is quite a lot of activities going on in my lab currently in this direction. And in the second part is the computational modeling and to, to, to identify risk factors. Currently, because the sequencing price is dropping very quickly, and we can like uh, get access to thousands of human genomes at one time for a particular disease. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to rethink about our modeling process. Previously, we, we think about a one nucleotide impact in the genome, uh, what, what, what's its impact in, in gene expression expression or the phenotypic variations. So in this time, with this amount of data, actually we can see the multiple phenotype, what, what, multiple genotypes suggested or some, some, some like uh, additive impact on the final phenotype. Actually, 
And this has some important implications, for example, for diagnosis methods or predict uh, preventive medicines. For example, we are trying to predict the risk factors for people to enter through some like psychiatric disorders. You know, for psychiatric disorders, it's very difficult for, for, for us to really have a sample from the brain and we do not want to cut the brain and cut some of the samples just for diagnosis. So what we do is actually, if we can get the genotype and we have a lot of regulation information, how we are gonna set up different machine learning models, models to predict from one individual's entire gen genome information, which is easy by a black draw to predict this person's risk for, for, for a certain type of disease, for example, psychiatric disorders. And then I'm also working with uh, uh, experimental labs for state-of-the-art new technologies. For example, we kind of trying to use high-throughput genome editing methods by CRISPR and trying to see if we disturb or we perturb the genome in some way, what is the functional consequence in terms of uh, either disease or intermediate phenotype. So that's another exciting direction that I'm following at this moment. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to thank my, my, my two students, uh, Flynn and uh, Jason. They, they have been working with me for many years at Yale. And of course, I'm looking for talented uh, new students. And uh, if you are interested in working in this direction, please do not like hesitate to contact me. And I'm also like uh, looking for some potential collaborations. We know that we have a lot of uh, experts in machine learning and uh, in, in our department, uh, we are, we are like, uh, excited to set up new collaborations uh, to explore some new directions uh, in, 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 in this context. And uh, that's my, 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 my talk today. And uh, feel free to ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jing. Uh, that was a great talk. Um... So yeah, I think we have that spent time for plenty of questions. So uh, anybody who has questions should go. Uh, hi, uh, can I ask a question about the uh, CRE prediction, the first yeah. part? Uh, is this first. all trying to predict uh, where the enhancer is actually located? Uh, uh, it's more than that, it's more than that. So let me provide a little bit more background about this, uh, this problem. <clears throat> we have been working with uh, the ENCODE Functional Characterization Center and Psych ENCODE Functional Char Characterization Center to do experiments to say, okay, if we knock out or if we active, activate a particular sequence in the genome, what's mm -hmm. the consequence of its target gene ex expressions? When we are doing the, exp the, the experiment, we, we have a difficulty that we don't know which, how long this enhancer sequence we should include. For example, if you use the previous unsupervised learning methods like HMM, their enhancer sequence is actually fixed length. But if we really look into the signal tracks of the human histone modification marks in, into the human genome, this length varies quite a lot. Some, some of them are very short, for example, like 100 or 200 nucleotides. Some of them are very, very huge and long. They can be up to 10 kilobytes like, like nucleotides. So this introduces quite a lot of difficulty when we are designing the experiment. So we ask us ourselves, so rather than like fix a size of the bin and answer a question within this 2KB bin, whether there's an enhancer or not, can we say what are the core elements that makes it an enhancer? So we can use that element in the, in, in the experiment. So within, so our model actually within a, a 1 KB region or like a 2 KB bin actually in our prediction that is very coarse, we try to say, okay, at each single nucleotide, how likely it will contribute to say, this is an active enhancer or not. And you will always say some, some shape of the, the important scores and you can use that to guide you what is the core element, what is the minimum component that you can use in a validation experiment. I hope that helps. Uh, is a Greg, uh, Greg can use to uh, get the important score? Yes. Uh, 
Yes. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, also, I have a question about the the last part uh, where you mentioned uh, the meta gene. Uh, yep. Is this an uh, imaginary concept, or they actually exist? Oh, this is not imaginal concept. Yeah, you can see, you can see I, I had some of the signal pathways. There are annotated signal pathways. So that's a group of important genes. They actually work together to, to carry out some important, very particular functions in the cell. This is not imaginary. Actually, if you, you search, there's a lot of public database, they say, okay, we have the annotation of the pathways, we have the annotation for like uh, Go communities. And uh, back to, I think uh, 12 years ago, when I started my PhD, actually I, I already used uh, like uh, those, like a uh, Gorilla, Gorilla Go and some uh, David like pathway information. I already started to use the commonly used pathway information. And uh, they are not like uh, some imaginary impact. They, they have been well known like uh, things in, 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 in biology. Thank you. And some, some more questions. Yeah, any other questions? If we do unmute yourself and ask. I was I was curious about the connection between the BRCA1 gene and I think it was AML. Um, I was wondering if if uh, like that connection was already known through uh, like a mechanic uh, or if that's a new connection. I'm just I was just hoping to hear a little more about that. Yeah. So we actually we we are trying to follow up with this. And uh, we, we know BRCA1 is a marker gene for breast cancer, but we, at least uh, when we were doing this work, which was almost a year, more than a year ago, and that was not really like linked with leukemia. And we were just uh, looking into the detail of how this, uh, this, uh, this gene is playing a role in a a AML. Actually, we have another work that we didn't uh, mentioned here. For each of the transcription factor, actually they have a score, which we call the regulation power score in each of the, uh, the patient, uh, in, in the cancer patient using its expression profiles. And then we try to use those profiles to separate the patient in, into different groups, uh, trying to, for example, find new subtypes or new biomarkers. So this is independent evidence. Uh, on the left, we, we, we use the co-regulation network alterations. On the right, we actually, this is from the expression data. And both lines of evidence points to the same gene in, in AML that is actually a risk, uh, like, uh, it's, it's a, it's a transcription factor that works like falling up in, in, in this, uh, this leukemia. All right, uh, let's thank Jing uh, uh, for a great talk. And yeah, let's end now. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Look forward to see everyone in the future seminars. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.